We are now recording. Are Thank you for your patience. I am Dr. Matthew Phillips. With me today is also Professor David Bernanowicz. We teach history at Tri-C Metro. Um, Co-sponsoring with us is the Stand for Racial Justice Initiative. This is something that we put together just over this week. Um, so we're very happy that word got out and that there are a number of people who have joined us both online and here in person. I also do want to mention that there is a an event through what is the peace and conflict studies tie if you want to mention that it, the event is a week from today next thursday yeah maybe i can talk about it right at the end okay a little bit, and that will be a good transition um and all for those of you that are online i'll post a link to it as well okay perfect we will like i said we're recording this so we also will have the links available on the stand for racial justice initiative website or webpage later as well as also hopefully a landing page for all Ukraine related events. Um, our plan today is to essentially offer very quickly six things to know about Ukrainian history and identity. I believe the session next week will be more on specifically the present situation, which I hope does obviously come up today as well. Um, our hope is that David and I will take turns talking for a few minutes about each of these six things and then have time for a discussion afterwards. Alrighty. So, for the most part, this is going to go chronologically, but I do think it's very worthwhile to make one very clear point about recent Ukrainian history, and it is something that we often forget, and that it is, I was sharing it. I swear I'm usually competent. All right, thank you, Nick. All right, that should be shared. Can somebody verify for us? All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. All right. Uh, something very important to mention is that independence for the modern nation state of Ukraine is only about 30 years old. All right. Um, they came out of a background of several decades being part of a union of Soviet socialist republics. And when that union fell apart in 1991, each of the separate republics went their own separate ways. And so this is how we end up with Ukraine, the Baltic states, a number of what we might call the stand countries. And anytime a country becomes independent, honestly, going back to the American Revolution, the French Revolution, it is immediately confronted with a number of issues, right? Um, with this modern idea of being a nation, or as the way that Lincoln phrased it, the challenge of creating a government that's of the people, by the people, for the people, that sounds very democratic, and on one hand it is, but it also creates a number of issues. I mean, who are the people, right? Um, borders refer to a country, borders are drawn in one way, but the people, that, however you conceive them, might not necessarily fall easily within a set of borders. And the reality of humans is that people with different identities live all over the place. So no matter where you draw borders, there are people who are going to feel privileged or on the opposite end of privilege, discriminated against. All right. Um, this really came to a head in World War One, World War Two, with so much conflict that we saw back then. Uh, the hope in the early 90s was that basically with the UN ensuring the borders on the maps that you saw, that all those different countries would make it work one way or another because anytime there was talk of readjustments in the past, it inevitably led to war, right? So the Ukraine that exists now is a product of borders that were created during the years of the Soviet experience. Um, one of the other issues for a new country is foreign pressure. You, you saw this in the American Revolution with the jockeying between France and England, France and Great Britain. You see this in Syria with everybody who's involved there. You see this in Ukraine. And there has been a poll between Russian influence and what can be maybe called European influence. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I'm going to mention some of this stuff just quickly for the sake of time. But this pull between the major blocks, the major powers, has had consequences, for example, in elections, right? 2004, there were, were allegations of widespread corruption in an election where essentially the one major candidate was pulled towards Europe, the other major candidate was pulled towards Russia. Um, it got so intense that 
we actually call it a revolution that broke out the orange revolution and they ran the elections again all right and you can see this electoral map all right it, between the you know the blue areas and the orange areas all right that being said something i want to stress throughout is that even though we're going to talk a lot about russian ukrainian division um, the story isn't simply one of division that'd be an easy one to understand right there's also years of basically being intertwined right identities that are similar in some ways right families that are merged friendships that are merged right and you have long histories of this so it's not all adversarial i think because of the nature of the topic this week it might come off a little bit that way but that would like i said make it simple if that's all it was this is a, a complex relationship like picture it almost like between cousins who love each other but also have quarreled a lot over the years as well all right it's one of those tense kind of relationships um, one of the major threads related to this Russia influence versus Europe influence is the NATO alliance, right? Which is a defensive alliance forged during the Cold War following World War II, right? It has expanded over the years to bring in countries that had previously been part of the Soviet-led alliance, the Warsaw Pact. And Russian leadership, such as Putin, see every addition as a threat towards them, even though it is a defensive alliance, right? And so that's something we can definitely talk about and will certainly come up next week as well. Um, it's also worth noting that until eight years ago, Ukraine's territorial integrity had not been challenged. There had been agreements made after the fall of the Soviet Union related to like giving up nukes and things like that so that Russia wouldn't, um, would respect Ukrainian borders. But in other areas near there, there have been Russian incursions. So in Moldova, which you can see is right next to Ukraine, there's a stretch there where Russians have basically occupied it for a number of years. Also, if you go down into the Caucasus, where you have the small countries of like Georgia, you've also had small stretches of land I'm where Russians sorry. Have. <laughs> I heard, I heard Oops, somebody got their microphone on. Hey Jennifer, sorry so about that. There's a way for me to mute people, so but it go didn't go out of all of this. Right. Um, um, eight years ago, Russia went into Crimea, which is something we're going to be talking a lot about as well. That is a peninsula that sticks out into the Black Sea that is historically very important for Russia and the other countries because it's up for trade. But there was a, okay. Give me one, one second to see if I can mute the individual participants. Yeah, the thing is, the list is so long. <laughs> <laughs> there. Mute all. Everybody's muted. So if you want to chime in later when we do the discussion, just remember to unmute yourself. All righty. So let me see, David, if there's anything else I want to mention here. Um, just the map on the bottom right shows the invasions and, and the bombings as they've occurred now, and we can talk about that more later, but it does follow the basically the pattern of the other map changes that we've talked about. But rather than focusing so much on what I call like the political science of it, we do want to focus on cultural identity formation. And so even though we started with the present, um, it's really important to go back to the beginning of what both Ukrainians and Russians consider their national creation story. And so, David, I believe you have some things yeah. to tell us about that. Okay. Um, can you hear me, first of all? Hard for me to teach in a mask. So, um, basically, uh, I'm, a, I'm a medievalist, so I go back to the Middle Ages. That's my job. And when we sat down and talked about this, he said, David, go back. So, um, it really begins. The distance of oh god, I'm starting to sound like a history channel program. The distance <laughs> of time in history, uh, back in the days in which you have, um, believe it or not, Scandinavians or what are called the Northmen, the Norsemen, who began to break out in the nine in the early 800s to seven and 800s AD out throughout all the whole world. You know, if you ever watch the History Channel, you know the Norsemen and stories like that, the Vikings. Um, one group of them went down the Dnieper River. And eventually, we're going to form a country called Rus or Kiev and Rus near the city of Kiev. Kiev. And they're going to follow the, Dan the Danfer River. And basically, they're going to vary on, as you can see with the one map, that one right there, the next one I'll open the call over. 
the top middle. Yeah, that one. That one, you can see the, the blue line there is the rivers going down. And you can see the, the nexus of, of communication between Kiev and the, the other parts of the world is going to be the, the water, the Black Sea, and Constantinople. Okay. Uh, according to tradition, now there is, there, medievalists have, we always have issues with some of our primary sources because we don't know whether to trust them or not or who writes them and things like that. But there is a, there is a book called the Russian Primary Chronicle, which basically talks about history at this time. And according to the Chronicle, it says that the there was a man by the name of Oleg, who was one of these Norsemen who settled the city in the Dnieper River Valley, named it Kiev, and was the first ruler of the area. Whether he was king, he was the ruler. Um, he merged, they merged together with the local Slavic people who lived there already. Uh, who were already living there. So this is a this is also a merging of the, the Norse and the Slavic peoples together. Uh, Oleg and his successors uh, founded a dynasty called the Ruru dynasty. Um, in the 10th century, there was going to be a man by the name of Vladimir the first, who in 988 decides that it's time for his country to become part of the world around him. And one way to do that was to convert to Christianity. But he didn't know which Christianity. Uh, whether it was going to be the Western Christianity of, 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 of the, the Pope in Rome or the Byzantine Church, which was going to be Constantinople, the Orthodox Church. Eventually, he decided in 988 to convert to Orthodox Christianity, bringing, uh, bringing uh, the Ukraine into and Kiev into this nexus within Constantinople. And it's going to be a commercial venture because from the north comes things like amber, which is petrified tree sap, Jurassic Park, and and all that stuff, you know, Jurassic Park. Um, amber uh, wool, uh, furs from uh, all over the place because, because there was no central heating. And more importantly, uh, another origins of slaves. The word slave comes from the word Slav. That's its origin. And so in the very early time period of, of the history at this time, around 1000, there was a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans that were taken as slaves down into Constantinople and sold off. So they were... They were part of that commercial commercial world. At the same time, the Kiev is rising. There is another country, another group of cities east of there, Moscow, Novgorod, Piskov, uh, each having its own principality, its own prince. Then Batu Khan came in, and as one of my professors once said, really mixed it all up. Um, Batu Khan, who was the great grandson of, of Genghis Khan, came in and conquered this area under the Mongols. For the next 150 years, the eastern part of what today would be called Russia was cut off from the west. Uh, uh, basically, what is going to happen, uh, the princes of Moscow and, and these cities of Novgorod and so forth were basically going to try to get, get their independence away from the, from the Mongol or the Tartar yoke, as they called it. And they had to pay uh, every year, they had to pay a yearly tribute to the, to the Khan of the Golden Horde, as it was called by that time. Which was situated east and east of the Crimea and the Georgia and, and southern Russia. And so what happened is that basically for 150 years uh, they were going to pay the, the tribute, and then in 1380 there was going to be a ruler, Ivan the Third of Moscow. I know this is real quick. I got to do this really quick. Um, Ivan the Third uh, decided not to pay the tribute, and so the 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 uh, the Great Khan said, "Okay, I'm going to get an army together." He got his army together. Ivan got his army together, and they met. They looked at each other across the river. A shot was never fired. There was no firing. There was no war. Uh, the, the, the Khan just simply turned around and went back home and never paid the tribute, never asked for it again. Hmm. So what happened was that um, Ivan basically, there was no real battle. The Mongols didn't ask for the tribute. So that's sort of like the independence of Moscow. Uh, Ivan married the daughter of the last Byzantine emperor because that was going to fall to the Turks in 1453. She was going to take the name Sophia. Uh, he is then going to argue from that moment on, this, the rulers of Moscow are going to pick uh, together a, a system, uh, both a theological and a political system called the Third Rome. Mm -hmm. The first Rome was the Roman Empire of the Caesars. The second Rome was the Rome of Constantinople, the Eastern Roman Empire. That is going to fall. With the Tsar, with, with Ivan III now becoming... Uh, now becoming the ruler of Moscow and marrying the daughter of the last Byzantine emperor, 
He is now going to argue that he is the third Rome. And they are going to be the protector, I think this is going to come up later, mm -hmm. the, the protector of all Slavic peoples, whether you like it or not, in some cases. Um, uh, my answers are Polish, so I mean, there's a lot of Polish history. Whether you like it or not, we are the protector of the Slavic peoples. And this is going to be running through Russian history and through this relationship. Um, Ivan did not take the name Tsar. His great grandson, Ivan the Fourth or Ivan the Terrible, was going to take that. And he's going to call himself, this is the title he took, either the Tsar of Moscow or the Tsar of all the Russians. And that becomes very important because by this time, there was this concept, which I first learned in my Russian history class, um, of the two Russians, the Great Russians and the Little Russians. Okay. The Great Russians were the Russians that lived in Moscow, and the Little Russians were the Ukrainians. And this was their way of controlling the narrative story of history, is that Kiev is the natural progenitor to Moscow, is the natural successor to Kiev as the Kiev begins to decline in power, Moscow takes over. And that's their narrative, which you're going to pick up on me, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, in some ways, yes, we're talking about medieval history of borders and king or principalities, you know, all knights and the church involvement and all that kind of stuff. But you also have the culture on the ground. And the borders shape culture, but culture also transcends borders. You do have this notion, though, that Kiev, Kiev and Rus was the origin story for everybody who would later use that term Russian in one way or another. But the new power center that emerged after independence from all of those people being dominated by the Mongols was Moscow or the Mos Muscovy Principality. So in that region that Russia, the modern Russia, would like to call all Russia, there's historically been two different power centers, all right? Kiev and Moscow, and then occasionally like the Mongols, or, yeah. you know, we're gonna be talking a lot about Russia today, but there also will also be moments of Polish or Austrian or Lithuanian involvement, right? And one of the questions is where does this identity of Ukraine even come from? You know, like where does the word even come from? And this skipped ahead, even though I only clicked it once because it has a mind of its own. I blame Putin already. But um, in the few hundred years after the fall of the Roman Empire, you had all kinds of people just moving across Eurasia. The Romans would call them barbarians. The Chinese would call them barbarians. It's a period of massive migrations, mostly from the east to the west along that steppe. Some people deposited in the area that we now know as Ukraine. And there were people who had also already lived there and had lived there for generations. They came from many different backgrounds, right? But for the most part, most of them were Slavic in one way or another, which means they had the same shared linguistic and cultural roots, right? Mm -hmm. Ukraine as a word really comes about through Muscovy use and Mongol use as referring to, and they talk about a different place every time they use the word, it was a lowercase concept of borderland. It's okay, there was some sort of problem in the borderland between this kingdom and this kingdom. There's a little problem in the borderland between this kingdom and this kingdom, right? It was just sort of a word that was attached to the area. But if you ask the people on the ground, say back in the year 1200, what, what's their identity? You know, you're going to get very answers that very different answers than what you would get in the modern period with nationalism. Right. They're they're much more small scale identities in a lot of ways. Alrighty, the history of being within empires shapes in some ways the Ukrainian identity. All right, at least in part. All right, you see this beginning with, you know, when the Mongols dominate the area, but especially when Muscovy power took over and projected this idea that everybody is Russian. Um, it picks up in the 1500s and 1600s, but it really comes to fruition in the nationalist era that starts in the late 1700s and goes through the 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. I refer to this as cultural consolidation, which is a term you could hear defined a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. But essentially, there is a process in most, quote unquote, modernizing countries around the world in the 1800s to intentionally create a national mythos on top of the actual naturally evolved cultural practices they already have. 
Um, one aspect of this is usually language. The Ukrainian language is distinct from the Russian language. It is distinct. It's closest largely still spoken relative nowadays is Belarusian, right to the north. Um, Russian is another East Slavic language, but it is a different language. And so most of the people in that region nowadays are, are bilingual, bilingual. And language for most nationalizing countries is a key part of that identity. And even in the US where we don't have a national language, it can become a part of arguments from people who are virulently and narrowly nationalist, right? Um, with the czars, as you get into the 1800s, they start enacting policies known as, I love this word, Russification. First of all, they take the word Rus, make them the actual Russians, and start enacting policies to basically erase Ukrainian identity or in Poland to erase Polish identity uh, by outlawing things being printed in the languages of those people, um, sometimes even targeting dress, right? targeting it, artwork, targeting anything that can be symbolic of projecting an identity that was not Russian. And you got to understand, like through the 1800s, the Russian Empire vast, dwarfs the United States. Um, you have, according to the 1900 census, I mean, I think there's over 100 notable languages they identified, over 100 notable different ethnic groups they identified. Um, Ukraine's a big one on the European side, but this goes all the way through Siberia as well. And then also the border between them and say like the Ottoman Empire and Mongolia, right? And Russia thought it was to their advantage as they modernized to also promote a single national identity. All of that does is amplify people in Ukraine to even more fully embrace a strong Ukrainian identity, right? Mm -hmm. You get figures who you can see statues for in Cleveland, like um, Ivan Franco and Tara Shevchenko, who go out of their way to do research on, say, Ukrainian folklore, um, studying the linguistics of the Ukrainian language, making sure they dress in a way that is distinct from Russian style of dress. There are many sub ethnicities essentially within Ukraine that we don't hear about in the news, but there's these groups like Boykos, Lemkos, Hutzels, um, a couple of other, others I'm blanking out on right now, but together they sort of have the shared experience that they're, the languages they speak are pretty similar, even if they seem like strongly different dialects and they have a number of similar customs. And so over the course of the 1800s, this meta identity of Ukrainian really crystallizes, really crystallizes. Um, you have other people involved in the, the movement as well who are interested in promoting Ukrainian identity, but also it's similar to what we would call the progressive era here in the United States, right? Promoting social reforms, women's suffrage, that kind of stuff, um, really embracing a distinct musical history a distinct fashion history, a distinct um, culinary history, right? Um, at the same time, you see Russia putting up statues like this, which is constructed in 1862 in, in Novgorod, um, celebrating the millennium of Russia. And here you see, I mean, they, they are embracing Russia as they are the inheritors of Rus. And that is the founder, whether he was real or not, we don't know, but Rorik, the founder of Kiev and Rus, and he's seen as a Russian national history hero. So the last point I have on this slide is you essentially have two people who are intertwined, but they share what they think is the same origin story, even if they interpret those origin stories differently. And that's powerful and complicated. Yeah. So where does it, what, what happened? So this is through the czars in the 1800s, so in the early all, 1900s. It's also the fact that the Ukraine was kind of gobbled up and gobbled up between on one side between the Russians taking it over, mm -hmm. taking part of the Ukraine. And then you can see that one map up in the corner of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, when Poland and Lithuania unite together into one big country, they move in and they take over the Western Ukraine. And basically Ukraine tends to disappear. And that's where you have the creation of the national identity. When yeah. you don't have a country, I mean Poland was the same way. It was divided up between the Russians the Russians, the Germans, and the Austrians. And when you don't have a country and you don't have a political entity to, to call your own, you have a tendency to want to create create your, your national identity. And that's where this becomes from in the 19th century. And, and the thing is with the split yeah. too is because Western Ukraine, which is the one side that's currently not 
largely surrounded by Russian troops. It's the, the gateway into Poland. Yeah. Uh, that part was under Poland or the austro galician Empire. And although there was definitely discrimination, they could still speak the Ukrainian language. And so a lot of that, that cultural consolidating was focused in the West, even though it also connected to the people in the East as well. Do I? Okay. All righty. So that, you know, the, the era of the czars, and that goes from the 1500s until, what what makes it all fall apart, David? The fall of the, of the, of the Russian monarchy? Okay. Uh, it's hard to, uh, basically, World War One starts, uh, and basically, the the, the 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 short story we have a we have the shooting of a of an Austrian prince in Sarajevo that starts a war between Russia. On one side is is Russia, uh, Britain, and France, and on the other side is is Germany and Austria Hungary. And so, because of the fact that it, from 1914 on, this creates a uniquely a unique situation for Ukrainians because Half of them are on the Russian side and in the Russian army. The other half are in the Austro-Hungarian Empire because they're from Galicia, which was the province of the Austrian Empire. So my ancestors so, came from yeah, right, before, right like just two years before so this. What you're talking about is basically, um, so there, uh, there was 3.5 million uh, uh, Ukrainians who were fighting in the Russian Imperial Army and close to 250,000 were fighting in the Rus Austrian, uh, Austrian Army. And so in some cases, in some of the battles that happened in Galicia, the, the Ukrainians are fighting one another across the battlefield. Okay, just like there were also Poles that were doing the same thing. Um, so what happens is that in 1917, as we need a short story in Russian political history, um, in 1917, Tsar Nicholas II, who was not the greatest Russian Tsar, um, who actually took over control of the war and basically loved it. Um, Pulled Russia out of the war. He abdicated his his position. Uh, Russia becomes a republic, and in that provisional government period, from the, uh, from 1917, the early 1917 to October of 1917, the Ukraine takes the opportunity to go independent. Okay, the war is ending up in 1918. Actually, the Germans are the largest. The German army is the largest army in the Ukraine uh, because they didn't leave the Eastern Front. Uh, yes, they did make a deal. With the, they didn't make a deal yet. They're on the Eastern Front. They're fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front and they're in the Ukraine. So they're staying in the Ukraine. And what happens is that with the end of the Tsar, the provisional government, there is this vacuum of power in Russia, in the Russia, and therefore the Ukrainian people decided to rebel. And, and for a short period of time, there's going to be a Ukrainian state. Okay. Two of them, in fact, one is going to be in Lvov, the other one is going to be in Kiev. Kiev. Okay. Um, guided by two different groups, okay, one German and one 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 British French, okay, and sometimes the two groups don't get along with each other, okay, but they're going to try to unite together, and then in in nineteen in nineteen eighteen the war is over, the Ukrainians declare themselves their own national government in nineteen eighteen, independence from Russia, the two groups did unite together, uh, the they were. They are part of the Treaty of Versailles, and they were recognized by as one of the new nations of Eastern Europe by the Treaty of Versailles. Then something happened in 1917, in October of 1917, depending on which calendar you use, right? Mm -hmm. November, no, October, November 1917, the Bolsheviks took over, in, 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 under Lenin, took over in, in Russia. And with that, Lenin began to re-expand his empire because of the fact he understood that Ukraine had something that Russia needed, wheat. It is the breadbasket of, of, of Russia. It's the Black Earth region, as it was called, as it's called. And so he needed that food, he needed that wheat, and so therefore he moved in and declared the Russian SSR, yeah, or the Ukrainian SSR, Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republic, which was going to be its own uh, part of the uh, the Russian system of government. Mm -hmm. And then that takes us past 1917 the 1920s. Yeah, so I mean, in, in the 1920s, everybody in that new Soviet sphere is, is coming out of a lot of drama. You know, um, you had the absolute horrors of World War I, which we often hear about the horrific French part of it. Yeah. Eastern Europe, there was a lot more movement in the war. So you're talking about villages being destroyed. You're talking about questions of borders being actively drawn and redrawn. Russia broke. 
because of the war. Their, their industry, their food production, it all broke. And so Russians start rebelling and hold on one second. Um, it's a messy civil war, which I think any civil war is messy, but you have multiple sides to this one. And the one winning party that comes out of it, like you said, is, is the Bolshevik party, which would create the Soviet state. But not everybody was really on board with what they wanted to do. And so over the next few years, you have a civil war where a few million people die. Right. And then on top of that, there's also massive starvation beyond the war. Ukrainian people try to create a country in this time period, but then as the new Soviet state expands, I mean, it quickly does gobble up this new government as well. And so then when we get into the 20s, Lenin, the one thing to his credit, which is a hard thing to say, but the one thing to his credit is that he thought there was strategic use in rejecting Russification and embarking on Ukrainization of the region as a way to get the people more amenable to being part of this new Soviet project. So teaching so you know Ukrainian language and everything comes back for a few years. But who in this room knows who comes after Lenin? To say it, Stalin, all right? And if anybody can make Lenin look decent in comparison, it's Stalin. Um, Stalin saw himself as the guy who would really make the Soviet experiment work. And Soviet experiments economically and socially had to do with something called collectivizing, where workers, whether they are peasants or industrial workers or anything else, would essentially be all employees of the corporation known as the Soviet Union. It was Stalin as the CEO, and he could move people where he thought they needed to move to. If they needed supplies, they would get it from the government. And then whatever they produced would go for the government because the government, not the free market, was deciding what would be built and where grain goes and that sort of thing. Um, for Ukraine, I mean, like David said, grain is just huge. It is a huge part of it, its own identity and also its draw for other powers like Russia. And because it's such a breadbasket, in the years leading up to the Soviets, the creation of the Soviet Union, there were a number of people who were peasants technically, but they had been able to create estates of 10 or more acres known as Kulaks. And Stalin saw them as enemies of communism, saw them as people who controlled something as important as food, but were making a profit themselves. And he was not very happy about this. He also believed some of which might have been true, but also a lot of it was very exaggerated of people working on these new collective farms in Ukraine who weren't giving the government what they requested okay. or hiding it. And this leads us to some really horrible history. I mean, just I got to give you a trigger warning on this. And also, I feel bad that we can't spend too much time on this. Have to. But the short version is, is that, that Stalin essentially gamed the collectivization system so that there would be massive starvation in Ukraine, all right, in terms of, you know, um, how requisitions would work. He also made it illegal for people to even leave the area. Um, he enacted a, a number of rules, I, I guess you could say, that essentially created a genocide by starvation policies. And between 1932 and 1933, folks, the, the, there are estimates all over the place, but it seems to be that maybe about 4 million people starve, right? And massive reports of surviving, the only way people could do that was by cannibalizing, right? This got a lot of, in some quarters, international attention, but also this was, after, you know, just a decade after World War I, and there was no wherewithal to do anything about it. Right. You know, in the American view, this was just like, oh, my God, is not Eastern Europe crazy? Right. Um, it even affected things here, you know, in places like Parma and Chicago, where you had large both Ukrainian and Russian communities and those tensions played out in, in those cities. Right. Um, and was there something you want to say that? Yeah. One of the other parts was not just a collectivization is that is that you could be accused of being a kulak if you if you were hiding your brain. And that's what that's what the NKVD's job was, or what was going to be called the KGB. Mm -hmm. Their job was to march in and look for these kulaks. Yeah. Another way of doing it, you're on a collective farm. 
all of the all of the tractors, all of the machinery is yep. owned by the state. The land is owned by the state. Your house is owned by the state. And so what would happen is if a tractor broke down, nobody would want to touch it to fix it. If they did fix it and it broke down again, you would be accused of being a wrecker, as they call it. Yeah. They put on trial and sent to participant a participant has joined the meeting. Sent to a sent to a uh, 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 a gulag in, in 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 Siberia just for yeah. touching and trying to fix a, a tractor. Yeah, and that was the whole purpose of that was to try to destroy the Ukrainian people. Yeah, and so I mean you have the genocide by way of famine, but also by way of forced removal. Um, I know like my ancestors got out before World War One, but the the cousins and siblings that were still in the area, you know, we'd hear like. Oh, they were sent off in this direction, and that's the last we ever heard from them. Um, or they were also did he tried to do the other thing, which was to transplant entire whole groups of people from one part of Russia to the other. Yeah. And then bring in other people into the Ukraine to live in the Ukraine and take the Ukrainians and move them out into Siberia and move Siberians into, into the Ukraine, yeah. therefore causing ethnic unrest. Yeah, and in the hopes that somehow that united russian identity would come out of it that kind of worked on the fact that, that that in the early days of the revolution stalin was the head of the nationalities department for mm -hmm. the for the for the bolshevik government so and, and i think one, one historical comparison you can make is during the time of the roman empire with trying to erase jewish identity and forcing communities to move throughout the roman empire in the hopes that since they would be a small minority in one place they would be subsumed by the larger culture but I think as anybody in this room and online knows, when you have mass victimization of a group, that just strengthens identity. Right. It, it doesn't weaken it. Right. Um, so interesting thing happens. I mean, Stalin's in power from the late 20s until 1953. You could not question him even if you were in the government or you would be disappeared. After he dies, an interesting thing that happens is that the other party leaders finally reach a moment where they denounce him to various degrees. And the leaders who come to power afterwards, including if anybody knows the very spirited Soviet leader from the 50s and very beginning of the 60s, who grabs a shoe and says, we will bury you to the United States, Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, Nikita yeah, Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev. Yeah. Um, he wasn't Ukrainian, but he was born right across the border from the Ukrainian SSR, and he loved it. From what I read, he was a fan. And... Can you mute yourself or I can probably go through and do it again. What is that under participants? What's that time? Got it. Um, you have a swing back towards Ukrainization. And under Khrushchev, what's interesting is borders are even adjusted so that partly for symbolic reasons, partly for strategic reasons, and partly because of his own views on Ukrainian identity, Crimea itself is moved from the Russian SSR to the Ukrainian SSR. I want to say it was maybe 1954 or somewhere around then. Late 50s. Late 50s, right? Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go through all of Soviet history after this point, but essentially you have these eras where Russification, it's Ukrainization, it's Russification, what changes in the 70s, though, is this new experiment of we're not going to say Russian or Ukrainian, it's Sovietization. We all have one Soviet identity. Um, and that doesn't go very far. And then in the 80s is when we get to the tail end of the Cold War. And we can just put on the map the one global disaster that takes place in the north of Ukraine, and that's the, the Chernobyl meltdown. Um, although I don't think that's directly related to our theses today. Right. Yeah. And then, even though we did go mostly chronological, it is very worthwhile to bring all of this back to us here in Cleveland. And David, you teach immigration history, you teach Eastern Europe. Uh, the, the, the migration of, of uh, Ukrainians around the world is, is around the world. As you can see on that map, it's, it's not just North America, it's Canada, for example. Ukrainian immigrants uh, moved to Canada, moved out to Saskatchewan. Got that right, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. They brought with them a new kind of wheat, which was called Russian, again, Russian red winter wheat, which meant that you could grow wheat in the late fall, early winter, and now allowing the creation of a two crop system, one in the spring and the summer, one in the fall and the winter, uh, 
increasing the yield in Canada of, of the wheat yields immensely in that part of the world. Um, when it comes to Cleveland, they came to Cleveland, you know, they started coming to Cleveland like all the other immigrants in search of jobs, in search, there's a pull to the United States for jobs in industrial work. This is the second industrial revolution in America, which we all know about, right? Uh, Maybe. This, the second industrial revolution, the factory system, thousands of workers are needed, hundreds of thousands are needed. Some of them come, well, most of them come by 1870. The, the hardest part to determine here is who was a Ukrainian, because before World War I, when they came over to the United States, they were determined by passports. So if you came from Galicia, you're a Ukrainian, or you're Ukrainian, but you're, you're Austro-Hungarian. And you're listed as an Austrian, or Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian. Yeah, my great-grandfather said Russian. Yeah, or Russian, okay, depending on where you're coming from. Yeah. If you come from uh, Poland, you're, you're called a Pole. I mean, you know, it, it, so therefore it gets very hard to figure out how many people showed up because the immigration records are so done that way. Because also Romanians are part are part of uh, Transylvanians are part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so therefore they're listed as Austrian-Hungary. Hungarians, Austrians, Poles, Slovenians, you know, uh, Slovaks, they're all that's all part of the Russo-Austrian-Hungarian Empire, so they're listed as Austro-Hungarian in, in the census records and in the immigration records. But a lot of them did come, and where they did settle most of the time was in Tremont, because that's right down right up the hill from the steel mills. Uh, where they mostly they worked steel mills like Republic, Otis, and a few other the companies that were in existence down in the Platts. So they actually would literally walk down the street, walk down the hill into the Platts to go to work. Um, if you ever have a time on a summer's day, uh, I want to, I tell my students to do the same thing. Take a suggestion to go to go to Tremont and to walk from Lincoln Park on Starkweather down to St. Vladimir's, the Russian Orthodox Church, just down the street. In a sense, it's a picture of what it looked like in the 1900s. Um, the houses are very close together. You can literally see inside the other house and very little front yards, small backyards. That's where they lived. Um, and they moved down, they brought their religion with them. Most of them were going to be Ukrainian Catholic. Um, some Ukrainian Orthodox come in in the uh, 1920s and 30s, but mostly they're Ukrainian Catholic setting up their first churches in, in Tremont, Ukrainian Catholic churches in Clermont. Um, uh, basically, they're, they're, um, the, uh, they're going to live there for a long time. They're going to migrate, like all the other ethnic groups, out of the city into Parma. And that's where you get Ukrainian village today in Parma, where the Orthodox were going to be the same way, migrate, migrate with the Catholics. To the point where you go up State Road, State Road there's a Ukrainian Catholic churches, Ukrainian Orthodox churches, it's a little Ukraine. I mean, again, it's it's... It's like going back in time, like little Poland, there's a little Ukraine, okay? And and that's where they're going to live uh, for the, on the west side of Parma. Would you say to some degree that the modern Ukrainian identity is shaped in part by the diaspora and not just the people over there? That's one of the, there is, there was the creation in 1952, there was uh, a group of people got together and they formed the Ukrainian Museum. And the purpose of that museum was to protect and still in existence to preserve the Ukrainian culture. Okay. And in a sense, the diaspora were the were the keepers of Ukrainian culture and life for a while. And, and diaspora just means movement, movement of mass around. amounts of people out of their homeland. And in the United States, they had a museum. The museum's still there. It's really good. If you, like, you can go there and see it, uh, they have a huge ton of Ukrainian newspapers. Uh, that's how they would do it. The Ukrainians had their own newspaper systems. They had their own newspapers. So at one given time, there were 100 of them around the country uh, written in the Ukrainian language. Most of them, when you read them, are mostly taken up about what's going on back in the old country, back in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and, and they're very interested in what happened in the old country. And in fact, during World War I, a lot of Ukrainians, or U Ukrainians along with Poles and other people, uh, went, to, went to Europe and joined the army, joined the American, joined the British army, joined the, joined the, the French army, joined, joined the army as volunteers to fight against the Russians and against the Austrians. Okay. And before we turn it over to group conversation, and we can go officially till 140. 140. Yeah. We'll go to two o'clock. Uh, but we can, you know, if people are talking, I'll stay here. I got yeah. coffee in my system. I'm ready to go. I have a class here, and they get out at 140. So you folks are able, happy, you know, you're you can just leave and say you hate me, right? Well, don't do that part. Uh, I do want to mention one thing, and it is going back to the terminology Ukraine. Um, you've noticed that 
anytime this is a discussion, people go Kiev, no, Kiev, or they go Ukraine, oh, the Ukraine, or the other way around, actually. The, and it's a hard habit for some people to get out of, the is seen by Ukrainians as a disparaging term. And it might seem kind of silly, like we say the United States, what's the big deal? But it's coming from the reference of somebody who's not there. It means the borderlands, the frontier, right? So it is an outsider's term for the people in the region, right? You say Ukraine, then it's an actual identity for and of the people there. And then also with language, Kiev is Russian, Russian. And that's what we've all been programmed to say. say I, I've read that newspapers and journals who have official codes they have to follow, like maybe they use Merriam-Webster or something else, even if they want to start spelling a K-Y-I-V, they don't have permission yet to do so because they're following officially a dictionary that's coming out of the old way of looking at things, which was dominated by the Russian perspective. And even saying Kiev, it's a step in the right direction and it's not right, but it's hard because it involves sounds and mouth movements that we don't usually use in American spoken English. If anybody in the room wants to make a stab at it, I know it's closer to like Kiev. Is it, did I get it? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm happy. I'm going to leave now. No, all righty. <laughs> Thank you. Are you Renata? Ah, oh, thank you. Okay, so we do have somebody in the room who knows a lot more about a lot of this than we do, and she will also be part of the event next week with Ty. And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember your last name. Okay. And which region is your family connected to? Um, well, it's actually Western and Eastern. Okay. Um, with respect to sort of the history of the um how displacements happen right because um on my husband's side so not blood related but on my husband's side he was computer um his family was actually a part of um, on one side they were priests and on the other side it was a very sort of artistic family and they were out in the city that's being bombed today Hatfield, but oh. filmmakers out, out there at a time when very few people were making film they were sort of innovators um, in the 1920s. So a tremendous amount of, uh, the city that's currently being bombed is a city of extraordinary intellectual scientific development. Which city are you referring to? Uh, I'm speaking about Kat Cube, but oh. my husband is from the west side, which is Lviv. Yeah, okay, that's where most of my family is from. But I'm, I'm fourth generation, so I'm fairly removed. So, which one yeah. of the Lviv? And I, I think the Cleveland-Pittsburgh corridor that seems to be the major city, the mm -hmm. region that people came from. Um, personally, I, I mean, I'm not, I haven't been there. I don't have close family connections. We've been chatting for the past 20 years with cousins, and this was actually made by a family member outside of Fluviv. But, you know, otherwise I'm coming here from somebody who studies empires and culture, you know, so anything that you can bring to the conversation at this point, I'd rather me not talk as much and anybody online can either unmute themselves and ask a question or send it in the chat. I haven't seen the chat as this is gone, but I'm gonna bring it up now. And then also anybody in the room, All right? I would like to have just an open discussion. It can be questions for anybody's expertise. It can be about identity. It can be about the present situation. What's on everybody's minds? Well, first of all, everything you said here is useless. It's all a lie. And, it, and all of you guys have to be put on a list, and okay. we're going to have to make sure that you're either put in a camp mm -hmm. okay. or you're taken out to Siberia. Okay, I don't care. Now, we sound silly, but that's, that's the kind true. of fear people have about this. Yeah. Let's talk about this. He decided that he sure. was going to use our history okay. and use history as a reason to justify an aggression towards an entire country. Okay. I'm from Albania. We are very close to Kosovo. Mm. And it's the same story that what is happening in Ukraine happened 20 years ago in Kosovo. Yes. No. They are 95% Albanian. They speak Albanian language. Yeah. Sorry. They speak Albanian language. They have the same culture as me. And they now are separate from Albania because Russia may have won that. And the problem is that 
if the superpower countries uh, come to help Ukraine or talk about in that time, it means that it's going to be it's going to be the third war. Yeah. So the dominoes would fall. It's very similar to World War One and in some ways World War Two as well. Yeah. And it's it's a worse than we are talking now. Yeah. I agree. It's really bad. What's going on? We have the same cell together. Yeah. Um, Matt, if, um, if you could repeat, like, summarize some of what is being said from the crowd, it looks like people online might not be able to hear it. Oh, well. oh yeah. So the microphone we have is the one that's closest to us. So I'm happy to repeat. And then also, if anybody who's talking, if you just want to, you know, really use the chest and boom. Um, so what are some of the things? Hi. Is that uh, one person was saying where it's hard to hear what people in the audience are saying. So if you can just summarize some of the comments. So, David, I'm going to pass it off to you. <laughs> well, I know that, I mean, the, the most recent thing was comparison. we have somebody in the room who's Albanian. And, and yeah. one of the things about this discussion and, and future discussions we're going to have is that it's not ultimately going to be just about Ukraine. It's going to be about making thematic comparisons or other sorts of connections as well. And the Balkans, Eastern Europe, has seen the same kind of volatility um, since the 90s when they had an experiment in a meta-nationalism called Yugoslavia, or all, basically all Slav Republic, fall apart and go in different directions. And then those questions of borders and how they relate to nationalities come up again. And I think the the major powers right now, they know their history and they know that, yeah, we want to go in, but the second that happens, we saw with World War One, we saw with World War Two. Um, and a point I forgot to make earlier, but it just shows how complicated this can get when major powers get involved. Um, when World War Two broke out, Ukrainians who had been just absolutely victimized by Stalin for a decade, now had the choice between him or Hitler, right. who also wanted Ukraine yeah. as the breadbasket, Lebensraum, living room. So when the big powers get involved, many other factors also get brought in as well. I think mm -hmm. it's a, a simple point to make, but one worth thinking about. You, you are the German Empire. Yes, so. We have a question from Declan. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm kind of out of the loop. I'm Irish. I have no idea what is even happening. I oh. was just going to ask. What is even Putin's reason for the invasion? Good question. <laughs> What's the, there are, Putin's reason for his invasion? <laughs> we have a, a lot of different thoughts, I think, in the room, and it looks like um, Renata's ready to, yeah, to go to the go find out. <laughs> and, and I like that you mentioned, as a launching point to get back to Putin's speech about Ukraine and all of this, that one of the things he even said was that Ukraine's not even a real identity. Not it's not a country. It's not a national identity, not and that's country. really scary talk because then that that's a that genocidal language. It's part of us. This is the mic. I'm gonna twist it when people are talking. At oh you. yeah, that way we're we're don't you can even put it directly on them at this point. Not it. You wanna say something? Yeah, yeah. Now we can make faces at each other. But okay, Renata. So. So I, I think the answer to that question really lies and, and why this particular conversation is so important, because the the motivation for any kind of aggression is a huge question, right? Because how many at the end of the day does a bully punch someone in the face, right? That's the question, why? And we can get into the psychological issues, et cetera. But here, I think really everything that was outlined here in the history really comes back in economics yeah. and it comes back in identity and it comes back into your specialization, which is empire, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And all of them come back together because at the end of the day, what he's seeking is power and yeah. affirmation. And what you guys talked about brilliantly at the beginning was really how economics is why Ukraine has always been at this crossroads, mm -hmm. right? So the Vikings are going down. What were they doing? They're, they're pillaging, they're stealing, but really they're also merchants. Yeah. And doing commerce. And Ukraine is a wonderful commercial channel, right? It goes from the north to the Black Sea. So this is already like its foundation there is already commercial because it's this intersection of trading. So number one reason is it's a great place to trade, right? You already have all the natural rivers. And another thing is again, coming back to comics, you mentioned um very true that one of the reasons why 
uh, the Russian Tsars wanted to secure Ukraine was for the wheat production, right? Because yes, and today Ukraine is still and Russia together, they they account for over a third of the world wheat production. Yeah. And 80% of North African countries get their production. So we have to be very careful with food supplies to North Africa now because they're going to be horribly curtailed, right? Mm -hmm. So economics is huge. But what else is huge? And this goes back to the Vikings. It's warm, warm, warm water port. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what's the first city that went down in Ukraine as of yesterday? It's Kherson, yeah. right? On the Black Sea. Because again, this goes down to power and economics. And you need to have access to the Black Sea, because from the Black Sea, you get out to the Mediterranean, et cetera, et cetera. And Kherson um, and Mykolaiv were the two industri industrial cities that built, built ships, right? Yeah. They need those back so that they can build their ships. Also very important, Crimea yeah. was um, really, it, it, Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine, quote unquote, right? But it was also logically connected. It economically makes sense because it gets its energy and it gets its water, fresh water supplies. Even though it's surrounded by the Black Sea, it's fresh water supplies come from Ukraine. Again, so it was a natural cohabitator with Ukraine. Now, so so, so economic reasons, right? Why, why does it, why do, how do we seek? So now we have to justify it, right? And it's our perception of selves, our identity, the identity issues you talk about and how history is used as a tool, right? If we can use history as a reason to justify an aggression, let's do it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is why, if all of you guys are students of history, amen, because we don't, we, we need to really, really, really look at the sources of history and what they're saying. And in this sense, Occupant has left the meeting. One of the crucial historical moments of Crimea was that it was ethnically predominantly Tatar. And the Tatars, we're specifically yeah. in order to de Tatarize this peninsula, Stalin takes and he removes all the Tatars, brings in ethnic Russians, and therefore says this is an ethnically Russian region. Well, this is its own form of genocide, yeah. right? Yeah. So now. And there are uh, Turkic people, um, primarily Muslim, um, connected to that old connection to the Mongols and other steppe people coming in during the medieval period. And when in 1991, many Tatars be began relocating back to Crimea because they could, the identity of being Ukrainian was no longer just an ethnic issue. It was now an issue that was being linked up with an ideology of freedom, of entrepreneurship, of, of, it sounds silly, but private property, right? Why did oh, at least 4 million people die in this artificial famine? It's because they had an ideology of, of ownership, of private mm -hmm. property, of this is my land, I must work it. And somebody else came in and said, no, none of this belongs to you. It belongs to the state. And if you are against the state, you have no choice but to die. And this ideology is why today, you see Russian speakers calling themselves Ukrainian. And there is absolutely no cognitive dissonance between the two. Because these cognitive, these, these Russian speakers are people who have formulated a Ukrainian identity of, that really transcends religion. It transcends an ethnic uh, basis, right? But so this is why, you know, why is he doing this? I'm not inside of Putin's head. I don't dare go there. <laughs> Somebody else hopefully will is, is, is there are people who, who 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 are going there and they need to because when you have somebody who is saying we are going to use uh, the kinds of weapons that are just absolutely diabolical, yeah. you ask yourself yeah. why? Like what has what have these people done to deserve a weapon that literally creates a vacuum and the right? irony evaporates here. you as a human being. Yeah. The irony, too, is that, you know, his declared motivation is that there is no Ukrainian identity. They're all Russians. Therefore, they should be part of Russia. Yes. And so if they're his fellow people, yes. then why commit atrocities? I, I don't know what I was going to come out. I, I have heard people who. Identity um, and power. But there are. Give you, to give you an example, let's go to Ireland. 
So I had students here talking about identity elsewhere and being a reason for warfare. Yeah, Ireland was under English. Okay. The Irish didn't want to be English. So the Irish, you know, from the 1920s on, there's going to be the Easter Rebellion. There's going to be an actual rebellion of the Irish people against the English. Why did the English stay? Because they wanted it. It's part of their empire. Okay. That's, I really do think that Pope thinks that he is the inheritor of the czars. That he is his language is his language much is more imperial Russia. I mean, I, the only link that I could think this to was I was thinking about this last night. Uh, I began to link this to the Crimean War, where you have Tsar Nicholas the first in eighteen in the eighteen forties, saying that I am the preserver of and protector of all Christians in the world, and that means including Jerusalem. So that means Jerusalem should be under the control of Russia. Turks get out. It's mine now. The Turks said no, and they started a war, okay, which brought in the British and the French. And that same kind of attitude that, you know, I want it. It's part of my natural, uh, our natural empire. And it's been part of ours. And besides, you know, the one thing that the commentators are often uh, concerned about lately is that I've been hearing over and over again about how Russian troops go in, and they thought it's going to happen like that. We, we have a good point. Going to march in and, you know, that's going to be it. They're all going to raise the red flags and yeah. join us, and instead they shoot them. We have a good point brought up here in the chat by Danny Burns, talking about the whole trope of denazification. Um, in, in the Ukrainian revolutions, especially the one about 10 years ago, well, not revolution, but the um, Euro Maiden, you know, there, there were a small minority. What's that, David? Oh, just, there was a small minority of the people who were fighting against Russian influence who were far right, just like you have far right protesters in the United States. Putin's made a really big deal out of that, but there's so many ironies with that, one of which is the fact that President Vladimir Zelensky himself is Jewish. And so, but, but I think what, what we're all getting at here, and back to your point, Renata, as well, is there's always a convergence of the economic and other power related reasons and culture. What, one thought I just had as you were talking about, like really st stressing the wheat part of it, is that the other major producer of wheat in the world is the United States. And in the 21st century, one of the biggest questions is going to be the same question that led to World War II in a lot of ways, and that's who can feed their people. And if you have the two major wheat producers in the world aligned together, that's a lot of power over ecology, over nature. Alexander? to the um, audience about the flag um, with the meaning of there. So I think that speaks a lot to what you're going you're from. Yeah. How about, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot. So, so Ty Olson brought us Ukrainian flag. Do you want to speak up or come along? You can even come and show the flag yourself if you want. Stand up for a second. So we have Alexandra Romanovich. What's your official title here? Uh, I'm senior manager for the Cleveland Humanities Collaborative. Hi, everyone. I was just going to say, um, speaking to the point about the wheat and all of this, um, the Ukrainian flag here. So the yellow is going to symbolize wheat, and then the blue is the sky, um, which so a lot of people, not so much recently, but a lot of times in my younger, in the younger days before a lot of attention on Ukraine, people would sometimes have it upside down. Mm -hmm. Maybe like they could just was water, but no, wheat and the sky. Interesting. Thank you. And then similarly, you also have the um, sunflower as a national symbol. Yeah. Can I um, chime in? Chime in. And then I'm also going to. And um, again, my student, you, my students, while we're switching between speakers, if you need to leave, I understand, but I'm also overjoyed if you do stay. And also anybody else online, you're welcome to hang out. I'm sure we have a lot of energy for talking and I'm not rushing away. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm Ty Olson. I manage and teach in our conflict resolution and peace studies program. And I just wanted to make a quick announcement um, before everyone takes off. I see people dropping off online, and and I know students probably have to be on to your next thing or grab some lunch or catch a ride home. Um, but next Thursday, we are going to sort of pick up where this conversation left off and talk about what's going on right now. And so Renata and myself have been organizing an event that's going to take place um, virtually. It's only virtually. We won't have an in-person session. Um, it will be next Thursday at 1130 to 1 o'clock. So it's an hour and a half. So we're going to have a little bit more time. We're going to have a variety of different speakers who are um, 
experts in their own right and are going to offer different perspectives as to what is going on, how is it impacting our economy, what, what are the implications in terms of international relations, um, and then also, and, and I'll, like, I'll hand it over to Renata to even expand on this more, but we're going to talk about why does this matter to us as well? Um, I see a variety of different people of different ages, different ethnic, different um, racial um, identities, and, and there is a tie. Even on NPR this morning, they were talking about like the, the immigrants in Ukraine right now that are trying to leave, immigrants from Africa um, and uh, the Middle East who um, have found refuge in, in Ukraine, right? And so, and, and my heritage is Finnish. I'm, I'm one of those like Scandinavian folks that, you know, uh, a, th a thousand years ago came down the river and um, what, whatever. Um, and what so, do you teach now? Peace and conflict studies, I know. Yeah, and the irony is that Finnish, Finland is one of the most peaceful countries in the world right now, um, though does not get along with Russia. Um, the joke is, I married someone that's from the Soviet Union. She doesn't identify as Russian, um, but my my grandfather, if he were alive when I got married, would roll over. He's probably rolling over in his grave because he would still identify her as a Russian, and he does not like the Russians. Um, but I think the other important thing to to keep in mind is that there are so that the, and and Renata can speak to this because she's enlightened my mind around this. But this is not the Russians versus the Ukrainians. Absolutely. This is Putin's war. Most Russians, and I, I can't you know, give a percentage, but there are a lot of Russians, probably the majority of Russians, that um, don't want to be, don't want this, right? Um, and and are, are protesting. We saw yesterday in the news that kids are being arrested for protesting, right? In Russia. Um, and so th this is really important, and and from from my area of expertise and my perspective, um, it's peace and conflict studies is is this weird area of study. People ask me all the time, what can I do with this degree, right? Or what can I do with this area of study? And we we as soon as these wars pop up, everyone comes running to us saying, okay. Why did this happen? Why got, why didn't you prevent this? Or or how are we going to resolve this quickly? But the reality is, we should be um, intentionally working for peace in our relationships, in our communities, with our neighbors, whether they're in the city that's next to us or the country that's next to us. Building strong relationships that are respectful um, all the time, because not just when violent conflict occurs, because it's through building mutual respect, even if we have very different ideologies, opinions, perspectives, values, identities, and beliefs. Um, it's through the continuing of building those relationships that's going to prevent large violent wars from breaking out, right? And so this stuff matters because there's stuff that we can learn from what is going on right now that we can be mindful and conscious of and. and Practice in our own communities and in our own workplaces and in our own neighborhoods. Okay, I know I'm done. Renata, do you have anything additional to add? I just want to support what you said. Like, if we, if everybody in the world was healthy, then we wouldn't need doctors. Right. Or would we say that everybody is healthy because we have doctors? Yeah. And if there is less aggression, less conflict, do we say perhaps it is, in fact, because we have been studying this and learning how to avoid it? Mm -hmm. Right. So that was the first thing, and I also want to support this idea of locally sort of peace and conflict should be part of our daily, very um, intentional action, right? In the sense of making sure our own behavior is not intentionally aggressive, whether it's verbal or physical. But I support that. I think that's what that's the that's the personal takeaway we walk away with. Thank you, Renata. So I, I'll, for those of you still on here, I'll let you join, and then I'm going to turn it back to Matt and David for final remarks. Do you want me to turn this one? Thank you, guys. For... So I, I, obviously, we have a lot more we can talk about. We will be having more sessions. Peace and conflict studies has theirs next week. Um, I want to thank, before we go, I, I do want to thank Ty and Renata. I want to thank Alexandria, um, David, as always. 
Um, and also helping us set things up, we had Brian Hall and Nick Yoho, and this was co-sponsored co by the Stand for Racial Justice Initiative. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now, but for anybody who just wants to hang out and chat longer, because you have that energy, we'll leave the meeting up for a little while. <laughs>